Now we're gonna move to the Old Kingdom. And the Old Kingdom lasts for, it's pretty specific, we know how long it was, 2686 to 2181 BCE, so roughly 500 years. It's a time of social cohesion. It's a time of stability. The wealth is expanding. The dynasty is doing well. Egypt is doing well. The kings are strong. And they begin commissioning colossal statues of themselves. These huge sculpted likenesses, giving them a place for their ka to live forever. And this is the time when we see the houses for the ka. It progresses from what's called a mastaba to a pyramid. Here are the dates for the historical periods. And in this class, we're mostly going to be concerned with Old, Middle, and New Kingdoms. We don't get too much into the time in between. We don't get too much into the late dynastic period. The, the point is that there's, there's so many dynasties and it's so complicated that in this course, we're not necessarily going to break down to first intermediate, second intermediate, late dynastic period. The periods in bold, early dynastic, the old kingdom, middle kingdom, and new kingdom are going to be our primary areas of focus. Familiarize with yourselves with this vocabulary because when I use these words, it will be easier for you to picture where they are. So this is a mastaba, and it is in a necropolis, a city of the dead. And there is a Ka statue, or would be, I don't know that this particular one's been looted or not. They're, they really, if you go to Egypt, you can see lots of these ruins, these very low, they just almost look like just, you know, little brick buildings or foundations. But this is a mastaba. And so this is the most common tomb. This picture shows you the inside of that. You can see the little door opening on the right-hand side here. And then there's another one over to the left. So they would have usually a false door with a false chamber in the hopes that the looters would just go there and wouldn't figure out that there was actually another chamber where the actual valuables were. So there's a vertical shaft that drops all the way down from the top of the mastaba down to the burial chamber. And that's where they'd put the sarcophagus. The kings of the third and fourth dynasty built the first two cities of the dead at Saqqara and at Giza, which are just outside modern Cairo. Saqqara is a little older, so we look at that first, and then the last lecture from the Old Kingdom will be the lecture at Giza. So this lecture is going to cover the evolution of a mastaba to a pyramid and the pyramid at Saqqara and its Ka statue and interior decoration. This is in your textbook too, under elements of architecture. So here you can see how these builders sort of evolved into building pyramids and got the idea for designing of a pyramid. And at first they just had those little structures that you just saw. I like it when you can see the actual thing. And then of course, because everybody wants something bigger and bigger is better, right? They started building them bigger and bigger and they built them by stepping them up into stepped pyramids. So this type of stepped pyramid will be what we'll see at Saqqara. And then eventually they filled it all in and they made it smooth on the outside. And so that was the pyramids at Giza. Here's an overview of Djoser's or Zoser's funerary complex at Saqqara. And so you can see clearly how this is mastabas piled on top of each other. And in this necropolis, there are many mastabas all around and all sorts of other buildings as well. This is a plan of this funerary complex. So again, we read these plans as though we're in a weather balloon or something on top and we've just chopped the top off. So all of the solid lines are solid walls and then the openings would be doorways. So you can see over to the left, this sham buildings, they're not real buildings at all these buildings here on the side, but the spirits can use them. They're not buildings for humans, but the spirits use them. And then there's a festival courtyard. There's North and South palaces, the court for the Serdab, which is the Serdab is where the Ka, Ka statue is. And then way down here would be the Ka statue. So the Ka statue in a complex like this is situated so he can watch the ceremonies and 
periodically there would be ceremonies and there would be festivals that would come and honor the Ka of the deceased. And every 30 years, they would come and have a festival for the renewal of the kingship. So it would renew his kingship every 30 years. And if it happened to be a different king, the spirit would just live on. So this particular pyramid, we know who built it. It was built by an architect named Imhotep. And Imhotep was a high priest and it expressed the God King's claim to supreme power. If you notice on the upper left part of this slide, I've the, got the spelling Z-O-S-E-R. So Zoser, there's two spellings for it, just to, so you don't get confused. D-J-O-S-E-R or Z-O-S-E-R are both spellings for the same person, the same king. So sometimes you'll see it in some books as one and sometimes as one other, but it is one king and he was the ruler of the first ruler of the third dynasty. His capital was at Memphis in Lower Egypt, which became the focal point of all of the cultural life of Egypt. This particular structure is the very first successfully completed large stone building in the history of Western art. So that's one big reason why it's important. Here's a closer up view of the brickwork. You can see all the little mustabas around the bottom of it. These, all these ruins are other people who had their tombs here. So Imhotep was revered as a magician. He was an astronomer. He was actually worshiped as a god in his own right. Imhotep is where the people that made the series of movies, The Mummy, the Mummy got their name from, but he was actually an architect. He was really a person. His name is inscribed inside the pyramid and he's designated as first after the king of Upper and Lower Egypt. So later on, this site was maintained for both Zoser and Imhotep. In Mesopotamia, the name of the patron lasted, whoever purchased the work of art. But in Egypt, the architect actually got credit for the conception and the building of a structure. And here's just some other views of it. You can get a sense of scale here, this person in front, the pyramid's far, far behind, and then here's a person here. Here's a close-up view of these sham buildings. This is the wall of the North Palace. They are covered with these engaged columns, and the capitals of the columns are in the form of papyrus blossoms. So this becomes an Egyptian column form. Here's some symbols of the Egyptian king because we're about to look at a Ka statue. We've already seen some of these when we looked at the palette of Narmer and the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt. Here they are here drawn out for you. Here's a seated king. He's got the sun disc on him in the copra. He's holding a scepter. Here's the falcon which is the image of the god Horus. So the king is the son of the sun god Ra and the king rules over both Upper and Lower Egypt, which system was fully developed by the end of the Old Kingdom. In the beginning of this, these lectures, we talked about the fact that the Egyptian gods transform and change and mutate. And animals always remain important, but in the Old Kingdom, they start really getting humanized. And when they're humanized, they begin building temples, they begin building places of worship, and they begin having new concepts of what life is like for the dead in the world beyond. And so this contributed to the way they constructed tombs, and the tombs are a lot like the houses of the living. So this God King, he plays a part in the political and religious life of the people, and even after he's dead. So he controls from the grave. He can speak on behalf of the living. So their statues are put in these temples and tombs. The living would come see these statues. They would get information from the kings that had gone before. So the king continues to rule. That's part of how he keeps his spirit long after he's alive on the face of this earth. We're first going to look at the tombs, which we've just done. And now we'll look at all the stuff they put in these tombs. So here's King Zoser. Look at him. This is his Ka statue. It's in that Serdab that we just looked at in Saqqara in the third dynasty. Is he not forbidding? Is he not staring out through the ages on this November 7th, 2016? 
We already looked at the sculptors at work and now you can see them in context. This is a whole relief and it's actually somewhat in progress. You can notice it's kind of drawn out on the top. It's living sculptors. They're portrayed in twisted poses. And then this, the statues are appearing in full profile. So this is really interesting because here King Zoser is preserving the memory of his own preservation. That is, he is teaching, this is how you create your imagery. This is my power. I had all these people working and making these images for this tomb that will last forever, for people to see throughout the next thousands of years. So that's the context where this image belongs that we looked at last time. So you can see this is, you know, quite a few hundred years later after Narmer that we have this canon of proportions is not changed. So this tomb decoration, it includes symbolic scenes and everyday scenes. And it's really our main source of information about these people. And the primary motive is to give the departed spirits a pleasant place to live. We also have paintings inside the tombs, and this particular one is in the tomb of T at Sisakara, and it was from 2450. T was a high official, so he had the money to buy an elaborate mastaba. So all of these relief carvings, and this is kind of degraded. If you look really carefully, you can see that there's trees and things behind T also, but the reason this picture looks kind of bad is because it's worn away. The subjects are all divided into registers, and this is a common thing that we've seen in other art forms. So all over these tombs, there'd be men in the fields or birds or fishing, hunting game, banquets, all kinds of scenes of everyday life. And they have this hieratic scale. It's used, they separate the officials from the servants. So as we've said, these servants, they need their soldiers, they need their boat, they need all of the trappings in the afterlife. And if you notice, there's a guy scratched out here, and that's because he probably lost T's good graces. So they came in and they chucked his uh, image out of there because T didn't want to spend the afterlife with this guy he'd had a fight with, which it just humanizes him, doesn't it? Now, T is hunting a hippopotamus here, which there's two things about this. For one thing, hippopotami, <laughs> are dangerous. And so you don't want hippopotami in your field. If you want to go and gather your crops, you don't want a hippopotamus chasing you. They're pretty dangerous. So we, they did need people to chase them off. It's the land was different then than it is now. And there was wild animals everywhere. There's wild game everywhere at this time. Also, it's a magic rite. It's designed to ward off hostile forces. You can see the T is bigger. He's more important and men are depicted as reddish brown. Usually women are whiter and men are browner. I'm not sure why, but you're gonna see this in another statue as well. One reason why this image of T is important is because of its landscape setting. And this is a new thing in art. We really haven't seen these the actual landscape set into imagery before the Egyptians, and the Egyptians do this pretty well. The background here, this is all papyrus, which is a sacred. Here's an, another painting from the tomb of T. It's cattle fording a river. Look at how naturalistically the cattle are, are portrayed. So these scenes of daily life are really offering artists an opportunity to widen their powers of observation. There's so much variety and I encourage you to go online and find pictures from these different tombs because the paintings are amazing. They're naturalistic, they're well-preserved, and you really get to see the hand of the artist in these. So we'll end by looking at Zoser again. King Zoser from Saqqara, 2650 BCE, and his Ka statue is watching over us through eternity.